that really need a lot more space inside them so that you can have portability, you really want whatever the smallest thing is that you can get. So you can actually just, you know, have a, like the Zeus Triple E has the, the chip soldered onto the board, and it's a fairly small chip by comparison to what it might be if you had to have a hard drive or even a 1.8 inch disc sitting inside the machine and carrying it around. It would really change dramatically what the ability is that you have with that laptop. So I'm going to kind of go over solid state hard drives real quick just from an idea standpoint. Um, the first one is DRAM. This is actually a solid state hard drive. Uh, it looks a lot like a rack mountable server. This kind of technology has been around for 30 years plus. Basically these are what you would know as DRAM. It's actually a system with a battery backup and it has the ability to basically hibernate your content. These are the types of systems that are used by banks and military and things like that where dust and things like that might be a factor but they're very high speed. They're, they're probably 300 times faster than what we're dealing with now physically as far as hard drives go. So, but this isn't really a talk about the DRAM stuff. The next thing is, is that the NOR chips and the NAND chips, what you would actually use currently right now as your solid state disk, depending upon which versions of things you're using, were both invented by the same guy in 1984. So right now, we're just now getting around to actually physically using a lot of really fast flash disks, but they've been around for 30 years. It's just not really been a constant thing that we've used. Uh, with the possible exception of NOR itself. NOR is kind of along the lines of like the BIOS. Um, it has a low number of times that you can write to it before it is actually damaged, and you put things in it that need to be very fast. So like your BIOS actually booting your computer, it reads the content really fast, but uh, there, it's not an easy thing to actually write content to this efficiently many times. So that's a very limited thing that they're using it for. NAND, on the other hand, has a a lot higher uh, amount of usage that you can use before it is damaged beyond being able to use the chip. The problem, at least up until about 2001, is that it was a much higher cost. And physically now it's gotten a lot to be a lot cheaper, so that's why we're starting to see it in flash disks and things like that. So let's kind of look at these chips. These are the important ones because this is where everything is kind of going from here. So this is a little bit of an extravagant picture of what actually happens inside of a NAND. This is the smallest unit that's inside a NAND. This is what actually stores the content. It's, uh, it's actually in binary, so it actually is storing a bit, a zero or one, unlike a hard drive, because a hard drive, like I said, is encoding a sound wave and then decoding it on its way back out. And I've taken a little bit of liberty here with this container, because this is not exactly what a gate looks like. So if you want to know exactly what it looks like, you might want to look it up before you get that far. But uh, basically you have a transistor on the top, which is the floating gate and transistor on the bottom, which basically detects if there is any energy stored in the cell. And then you have an oxide, which is a, a thin coating in order to actually push an electron in. So an electron is shoved into this through what's called uh, hot electron injection. <laughs> hoo <-yah. laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> so basically the state before the electron was shoved into it was a state of one. So most of us that are used to dealing with computers, you know, typically we're thinking if there's nothing there, it's a state of zero. But in this case, when there's nothing there, it's in a state of one. When the electron is shoved into the cell through the hot electron injection, <laughs> you know, I gave this speech once before and they said, uh, they said I should make that electron look like a little sperm swimming around and, and I decided against that. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> back to what I was saying. Uh, so once it's actually ch in there, it actually changes the cell. Now, typically right now, at least up until just recently, like the last two years or so, we've been dealing with what's a single layer chip. So SLC is what it would typically be known as. And they're starting to play with the idea of what's called uh, a MLC. And an MLC is being able to make multiple layers and store the content in it. The thing is, is that when one of those cells is written, you have to write them both, or however many layers that you have. We have, at least right now, as far as I know, up to four different MLC layers. So typically you're gonna be looking at a two MLC layer. It's exactly the same as the single layers, just two of them, and they both write at the same time. Um, so typically if you're looking at something along the lines of, you know, 16 gigs of RAM on your new iPhone or something like that, you're typically looking at an a, a MLC instead of an SLC. 
and you have some limitations with that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you look at the possible allocations, the more layers that you have, the more data or the more flexibility you have with actually storing items in the cell and getting higher pieces of information by storing it in binary. So that's, we're going to go back to the, to the single layer chips, <clears throat> and we're going to continue forward with this. Everything else is exactly the same for MLCs. So basically, you still have a byte, and then from a byte, you would actually go to what is called a word line, which would be 16 in a row. The reason I bring this up is that because basically NAND is in a, in a grid. It physically is sitting in a grid, and you can't talk to any individual item inside the grid. You cannot talk to one particular bit. You have to talk to the entire grid, and it's done through a word line. But even that's not the smallest ability that you actually have to talk to. You still have to talk to a sector. So a sector is the smallest unit of data that can be written in Flash, period. Most of you are probably familiar with that if you already know something about hard drives and things like that, because typically you still have to write to a sector. Uh, and you're typically looking at 512 bytes. The thing is, and that's an estimation of 512 bytes, before we had 256 meg memory sticks, 512 was the standard that you were looking at for a sector size, which is the same as it is in a hard drive. But now, after they exceeded 256 megs, they started to play with the sector size. So in no other storage device, at least as far as I know of from that standpoint, have we had variations in sector size. We now typically have a sector size that's 2K. It's four times larger than the sector that you're looking at on a hard drive right now. So when you write one file, you are, you are writing more content than you wrote before physically. <clears throat> so that will change, and that will make a change to the physical amount of data that you're storing there. But even more than that, things are controlled in blocks. So a block can be multi multiple different sizes. Again, the manufacturer can choose how much he's going to store there. So if you have a sector, and if you guys aren't getting this, you'll, you'll see in a minute there's just a, a kind of a chart, and it'll explain it a little bit better because you'll see it laid out what I'm talking about right now. Um, because sizes are very important when it comes to dealing with the flash and the NAND blocks. But a block is the smallest unit you can erase. You cannot erase a sector. You can only erase a block. So once you've written data to it, the data is there and cannot be changed until you erase an entire block. Now, a block is typically, in our current memory sticks, is going to be 64 times the sector size. So if you can do that math really fast, you'll probably figure out something like 128K. So that's how much data has to be erased every time you want to write something back to one of those sectors. <clears throat> so the block erase cycle in the process of doing that, uh, the kind of unusual story, and I've took some liberties here too, it, they don't really pop up like that, okay? And there's nothing inside the chip that's popping up like that. But <laughs> in 1984, when this was invented, uh, one of the associates of, of Dr. M there in the previous uh, slide, he basically said, hey, it looks like a flash from a camera when you're releasing the content. And that's how we got the name Flash. It was physically from what he thought looked like a flash from a camera. The reason that that is the case is because in order to erase a block, you are basically uh, applying power to the entire block to open all the gates, to let everything out, so all the electrons fly out. And so this is what it would look like if you were trying to look at it. It just looked like a little power surge as it escaped. <clears throat> 